It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, again, I feel honored to be invited, you know, and uh, certainly honored to celebrate Danny's life. I'm changing the uh, talk a little bit from what I initially intended and what the title started, and I've decided to go with a little bit more of a Danny-centric talk <laughs> rather than a Wiccan-centric talk. And so I'm going to be tracing uh, a good deal of history, particularly my history with Danny and sort of our collaborations and the parallel paths that our work took. Um, o Training, O Multiple Resources, that's a paraphrase of a title of a, book, of a very nice chapter that Danny did with Andreas Sanders, with who he collaborated. Uh, but I'm going to talk about a, half, a quarter of a century with Danny Gopher and his triangles. That is the period from about 1970 to 1995. And you ask why triangles? And triangles, well, as I started thinking about Danny's academic life, as we'll see, I realized there are lots of ways in which his life can be defined by triangles. We'll see that in the next slide. But also in terms of geometric structures, the triangle is the most rigid, sometimes stubborn structure, but it doesn't collapse. And that sort of characterized certain things about Danny, too. Uh, rigid, strong, and, uh, and very viable. So, uh, what are these triangles? Let's see. Uh, yeah, there we go. I hope you can see this, but um, starting at the top, we see the triangle that defines the relationship between attention and two carat moderator variables of attention. Training on the one hand and individual differences on the other. As we move down, we see a triangle defined by basic laboratory research on the left, applications on the right, and sort of the mediating role of engineering psychology in the middle. And certainly Danny uh, typifies working on both ends, but very heavily in that middle area of engineering psychology. Down below, we have more geographical triangles. Uh, <laughs> the two main corners of Danny's life are Israel and Illinois. And I apologize as a guest here, I should have put Israel on the top, but uh, <laughs> I'm Illinois-centric. And, and then there's the rest of the world out here, of course, <laughs> that has a very number of other characteristics. Within Illinois, the triangle with which Danny was associated was aviation, psychology, and engineering. And these are three different labs I'll talk briefly about. Um, and finally, as we move up towards the top, we have multiple resource theory, which really, I think, very much entwined Danny's research life and my own in a way I'll be describing shortly. And we'll be talking about the three components of the architecture of multiple resource theory, multiplicity, resources, and allocation. But let's uh, kind of begin the story up at the top again with attention and look down towards individual differences for a moment because that really defines the start of Danny's attention career, working with Danny Kahneman, looking at individual differences in attention switching in a dichotic listening task, but showing how that fairly basic measure from the laboratory very nicely predicted performance in aviation, predicting aviation accidents. So it was a nice link between basic and applied research. Um, Danny Kahneman, um, we all know, and certainly had a tremendous academic influence on Danny Gopher. But even during this time, before I met Danny, he had an influence on me as well. I was working out in the rest of the world at University of Michigan on my dissertation in parallel. But getting into doing the dissertation, I read Danny's Kahneman's book, Attention and Effort. Have some of you read that, I assume? It's an absolutely beautiful little volume. It's, a, it's, it's one of the best books I've read. And for me, it was inspirational. It both inspired me to do my dissertation work focusing on attention as well as really turning my career, academic career, towards attention. Uh, at this time, uh, you know, cognitive psychology, or really psychology was very much dominated by the behaviorist view and, you know, all you could talk about and thing were, analyze were things you could look at. Uh, he portrayed attention and effort as these concepts that existed within the brain, obviously modified behavior, but were not part of behavior itself, and I found that extremely inspirational. Okay, so Danny's working in Israel, I'm working at Illinois, and our worlds converged in 1973 when uh, I came for a job interview 
and um, went and gave my job talk. And I don't know if you remember Danny. Uh, Danny was in the audience, and about 40 minutes into the one-hour talk, there was this milling around outside, and a whole gaggle of clinical psychologists were waiting to get in for the next job interview. And <laughs> it was a very frustrating situation. Um, but anyway, as I was giving the talk, and there was this really enthusiastic guy in the audience that I didn't know was asking all these insightful <laughs> questions. And I say, you know, who is this guy? <laughs> And afterwards, he comes up and he says, I'm Danny Gopher, you know, da, 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 da. and um, so we had some very, a very good dialogue, and I went back. I did get the job offer, and I like to think that Danny had something to do with that job offer, or at least convincing them that I should be hired. It was a difficult job uh, market at that time, and that was really the only offer I had. He says, yes, he confirms that he had some influence, so thank you, Danny, I appreciate it. So anyway, um, our roots sort of converged at, oh, did I go backwards? Yeah, okay. Uh, converged at University of Illinois uh, when I showed up in the fall for uh, the, uh, my starting to, to teach. And Danny was there at that time. And he was very closely connected at this time with um, aviation psychology at Illinois. And so here's the triangle of research areas at the University of Illinois at that time. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the top part of the triangle, and that is the aviation psychology or aviation human factors program at Illinois. Um, this was just a, a wonderful research environment. Um, it consisted of a pilot training program that had both flight instructors and student pilots taught as part of their <coughs> academic curriculum. So there's a large body of what we would now call subject matter experts, SMEs, both novices, the student pilots, as well as experts, the instructor pilots. But most importantly was the second component, the Aviation Research Laboratory, which was headed by Stan Roscoe. And it was located out at the airport, at Willard Airport. We had a fairly large number of graduate students, and many of the graduate students were, in fact, flight instructors. And so you had students that were interested in pursuing graduate education, but also had the domain knowledge of flying. And certainly flying is one of the crucibles for studying multiple task performance, as well as training. Uh, a fair number of psychology professors, about five or six of them, uh, among them was, I thought Danny was a postdoc. He tells me now he was actually a professor at that time uh, on the faculty. And uh, we did a large amount of research. Uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research funded most of this. And as you might expect, a lot of that research was on training. How do you train pilots? What types of training strategies and techniques can develop the best trained pilots? But a second line of research focused very heavily on multitasking in the cockpit and trying to come up with an understanding of how pilots actually timeshare tasks, divide attention between different tasks. So Danny was heavily involved, certainly, in the training research at the Institute of Aviation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But where the two of us joined forces and really became collaborators, I think, was in uh, actually working with Bob North, a very talented graduate student who was doing his dissertation on multitasking. And really about the same time during that first year, I was trying to analyze my own data for my dissertation, trying to turn it into a publication. And that was a study of time sharing between tracking or flight control and other types of tasks. And so we both collaborated on Bob North's dissertation. Danny was advising him. I was sort of a secondary advisor to Bob. Danny was giving me advice on my dissertation work and writing it up and so forth. And we had this really, I'd say, fertile interchange, another triangle, you might say, of intellectual collaboration between the three of us. And out of this really was born uh, what I think of as multiple resource theory. And those of you in engineering psychology are probably familiar with this. But if you're not, let me just give you a very brief overview. Uh, multiple resource theory 
predicts how people will timeshare the success or failure of doing two tasks at the same time. It's got three components. Multiplicity defines the fact that humans have more than a single resource. There's not just one pool of mental effort up there, but it's differentiated in ways that I'll talk about a little bit later on. And so the two tasks that are similar in terms of their resource demands are more likely to interfere with each other than dissimilar tasks. The resource demand component says the tasks vary in their capacity of demands on the brain's energetic systems, and two hard tasks are more likely to interfere than two easy tasks. This is common sense, of course, in a lot of expense, but these two interact in some fairly complex ways. So the demands or difficulty of a task, how similar they are, determine how much they interfere with each other. But the question is, when you've got two interfering tasks, which one suffers, which one gets preserved? Or do they both suffer equally? And that's the vital role of this third component of multiple resources, which is allocating the decrement. When there's interference, which one suffers, who gets primary, which task is primary, which is secondary, and so forth. Okay, so these are the three components of multiple resource theory that more or less emerged. Bob Norris' dissertation focused very much on the multiplicity aspect, this idea of different structures. Auditory and vision use different resources. Two tasks, both using vision, use the same resources. And focused on the structural differences causing interference. My own dissertation data that I was working at was one that showed that harder tasks can interfere with each other less than easier tasks if the harder tasks use different processing stages. And so if you can read down at the bottom, it really helped identify the idea that perceptual cognitive resources, sort of the front end of information processing, use different resources from those involved in action and responding. And so if you had a perceptual cognitive task and a responding task, even though both of them might be fairly difficult or demanding, they could be performed fairly well in parallel because the brain seemed to be divided in different resources related to cognition and to action. Okay. Well, about the same time, um, Dan, uh, Danny also had a parallel life at University of Illinois in which he was involved in the training side. This is now our sort of attention triangle and was working with Gavin Lintern, Bob Willigus, uh, the late Jack Adams on studies on adaptive training. And that was uh, training where essentially you start a task at a very easy level. As expertise progresses, you make the task progressively more difficult. More or less, you keep the same constant resource demands on the task because as automaticity is mastered, the task becomes more difficult. Um, he was doing this. They were looking at how to train pilots. Again, some, I would say, fairly groundbreaking research, which has stood the test of time in terms of the advantages of adaptive training. And one of the characteristics of this line of research in terms of our triangle of research types is it was feeding fairly heavily into applications. And I think Danny was actually more into applications at that time than I was. I was only beginning to learn the importance of transferring theory to applications. Well, then Danny vanished in 1976. And I should say that uh, we had a, well, I had uh, so two young kids. Danny's had the young kids and Esther. And the two families, we had a lot of collaboration, good trips to Chicago, good trips to uh, St. Louis, and so forth. And then around 1976, Danny vanished back to Israel down here to the other triangle. We lost touch a little bit, but then all of a sudden, bang, out comes this incredible publication with David Navan on the economy of human information processing system, which was essentially an elegant, I would say, mathematically based treatise of what multiple resource theory was all about. Uh, it focused on the relationship between all three components talked about how humans could optimize performance with separate resources, and essentially described how resources were shifted from one task to another to compensate for the increased demand of one task. 
If resources were shared, it was possible. If two tasks demand from the same pool, you can shift resources back and forth between them. One becomes more difficult. You can compensate by shunting resources to the other one. But if resources were shared, it was possible. But if resources were not, multiple resources, then you could not always have this compensatory activity. In the same way that in the economy of a country, you can't always withdraw resources, say, from defense to uh, social welfare programs. That's certainly the case in the US. So it was a very, very nice, I would say, elegant theoretical treatment of the precepts of multiple resource theory. And more or less at the same time, I was involved in doing kind of the trench work, uh, grunt work of pulling together at this time, and this is the mid-70s or late 70s, all of the dual task performance studies I could find in the literature, and there weren't all that many at that time, because attention had been, research had been focused much more on auditory attention and dichotic listening. But by trying to pull these studies together, I did kind of a, neta, a meta-analysis that said, well, what would be the actual dimensions in the brain that might define these multiple resources, for which Danny and David Navon had defined how these should play out in actual dual task performance. So just a very brief uh, foray into my the own work at the time, what emerged from this meta-analysis was the four-dimensional cube model of multiple resource theory. This may be nauseatingly familiar to many of you because uh, it's been around a long time. But if you're not familiar with it, I just want to point out this representation that resources could be defined on four dichotomous dimensions. One was the idea of stages of processing, which emerged from my dissertation. And I should say also some early research I did with Colin Kessel, who followed uh, and was actually my first graduate student at, at Illinois. And, uh, Colin sort of followed Danny in some respects. Uh, but the idea that perceptual cognitive processes use different resources from responding. The second dimension was that of codes of information processing and that spatial resources were different from verbal and language resources, linguistic related resources. And of course both of these dimensions, the stages and the language or spatial verbal of the code dimension could be characterized by different brain structures. In the first case, sort of uh, anterior versus posterior. In the second case, kind of left and right brain. And there are lots of qualifications to this. Within the front end of perceptual and cognition, we can define the difference between visual and auditory resources, not only the eyes and ears, but the visual and the auditory cortex, and a new member to the team is the tactile dimension, and this now we've done enough research on tactile processing to suggest that that really forms a separate level of perceptual resources. And then finally within vision, we were able to define, looking at the dual task data, to define the disti distinction between focal vision for object recognition and print versus ambient vision for controlling flow fields walking, navigation. Okay. And the general precept of this four-dimensional space is to the extent that two tasks share the same level along each of the four dimensions, the interference between those tasks will be progressively greater. Okay. And it's defined, again, both in terms of brain structures, but also in terms of dichotomy, dichotomies that matter that can, designers can use to make a difference to try to improve multitasking in environments like the cockpit or the driving, uh, automobile driving, and other environments as well. OK. Well, while Danny was in Israel during this time, I think some of the major things that he and his research team developed were so focusing more heavily on the top of the attention triangle, the multiple research triangle, that is the issue of allocation. And there was a whole set of studies, very insightful studies, about the capabilities of people to allocate ta resources between tasks, sharing common resources, sometimes using different resources. And out of this grew the important concept of the performance operating characteristic, or POC, 
Um, and the idea behind the POC is that if a person is asked to do two tasks, and I'm showing task A in red at the top, as you put, invest more resources into the task, you will do better, okay? Task performance improves, the red line goes up. If we look at the second graph, task B, consider the blue line, and as you reinvest more resources into the task, performance also improves, although by a different function, it's not a linear function in this case. And then what you can sort of do, and what I've done is sort of plot the two task performance resource functions on the same axis, but now I've inverted the red one. So we can think of kind of allocating resources back and forth. Here you're concentrating fully on the red task. Here you're concentrating fully on the blue task. And as you move this allocation back and forth, you're going to get a trade-off between tasks. And what Danny and his research team did over here is really come up with this idea of cross-plotting the performance of one task versus the other as resources or priority is changed between the two. And from the shape of this curve, you can sort of do a reverse engineering and derive the shape of these individual curves and how much a task improves or degrades as a function of whether you try harder or less hard, give it more or less resources, or in the terms of Danny Kahneman, more or less effort invested into the task. So during this period of time, really in, I guess I would say, probably the early 80s, Danny Gopher working with David Navan and Mike Brickner did a lot of studies examining the capabilities, human capabilities in this allocation characteristic of the multiple resource theory. How well, how gracefully could people titrate the amount of resources to one task? And clearly showing that it was more than an all or none thing. That is, people are capable of truly time sharing. You don't do this task or this task. Oftentimes you do time share and you can put a graded emphasis between the two. And I think out of this emerged this concept of attention as effort, as a graded capability, and not simply an all or none switch. And there was a conference, a wonderful conference at Les Arcs, um, sponsored by NATO in France, uh, up in the high Alps. And it really, I'd say, brought together a forum of a lot of people who thought of attention in terms of this analog graded quantity and thought of resources as being something directly that it really existed within the brain and it wasn't just a metaphor for performance, there truly were things like resources. And certainly subsequent research from ERPs, from fMRIs has continued to conform the idea that resources were a continuous energetic property and not just something like attention was not just a discrete switch that went to one place or the other. Okay, so um, where we travel in the triangle next, and this is our attention training individual differences triangle, and there's our multiple resource triangle up at the top, and as I say, Danny and his colleagues here were focused very much on the allocation idea, but as the 80s progressed, they went from thinking about allocation as a critical tool for understanding how people multitask performance to recognizing allocation now as this critical skill that can be trained. And so again, Danny's really working on both multiple task performance but also thinking of the allocation component as a critical trainable skill within, dual, within uh, complex environments. And so the thinking went, well, it's a trainable skill if it's trainable, it should be transferable then to other tasks. We can train it in one environment, tell people to allocate back and forth, transfer it to another environment. And really about the same time, the whole notion of executive control began to bubble up in other aspects of cognitive psychology. Gordon Logan, a few of the other researchers in the 80s began to talk about this. And there was a clear linkage between the allocation concept in multiple resource and the executive control function that other people will talk about. And at this time, I think I'm beginning to 
converge or be a little bit redundant with some of the earlier talks, both Danny, both Art Kramer's and also Yaakov's talk about this notion of priority allocation skill, variable priority training, and the idea, and this was versed by Danny and his co-workers, that you could train people to differentially allocate, dynamically allocate resources between tasks. You could transfer that to a different multitask pair from that in which it was trained. You could also teach a variable priority skill and you could transfer it to multitaskers who must cope with an increasing demand of one task by reallocating another task. So you're doing two tasks, you're driving and you're talking on the cell phone, or <laughs> one is, and suddenly there's an increase in difficulty in one of those tasks. Can you now move attention from one to the other in order to compensate. And as been pointed out in a couple of uh, talks previously, certainly uh, Art mentioned this, the finding that it transferred to real performance in real world multitask environment. And the, the ultimate crucible of multitasking is of course the fighter cockpit. And the study with Gopher, Weil, and Barricade showed how nicely that pilots in pilot training who were given this variable allocation skill training uh, wound up being more likely to be selected for fighter pilot training, which is the heaviest time-sharing demands of all of the different Israeli uh, aviation or uh, piloting uh, tracks to take. Um, the variable priority training has been picked up in many different ways. Art Kramer, working with uh, John Larish and Dave Strayer did an earlier study showing how the training in this skill could help older adults cope with multitasking situations. Um, I had a kind of a personal experience. I was coaching a girls junior high school basketball team at, uh, they didn't do very well. It was university high school and kids that had never played sports before. There's another story about sort of the tragedy <laughs> of how bad our teams were. But I did employ that in terms of teaching the girls to simultaneously dribble a basketball, one skill, but also be aware of what the defender was doing, another skill. And these are two somewhat separate components. And one of the things I worked about was trying to teach them to go back and forth, focus on dribbling, now focus on defense, and essentially treat them as two tasks, but do them, train them at the same time and train them to uh, uh, shift attention between those two as necessary. Year of training, we won the state championship. No, just kidding. <laughs> I think we improved from like, you know, 2 and 20 to maybe 4 and 16 in terms of our record. Okay. So, um, Danny came back to Illinois many times, but an important return to Illinois was he came back and got uh, more involved with the Cognitive Psychophysiology Lab, the CPL, where Manny Donchin was, uh, was head of that lab. And as many of you know, Manny really developed a lot of the early uh, studies on event-related brain potentials, evoked pot potentials, and the P300. Uh, I was also privileged to work in that lab, as was Art Kramer, and we had kind of an exciting group there. For me, some of the early work in the lab helped solidify this idea of stage-related resources. So we did studies of the P300 that helped reify this notion that perceptual cognitive resources were different from those related to action. And also helping to develop measures of mental workload. Uh, for Danny, the big opportunity was to work with the Space Fortress Training Project, and Art alerted, uh, alerted alluded to that later. The Space Fortress game, which you're all familiar with now, various researchers use different strategies to try to train people to expertise in that. And of course, Danny being Danny, said let's put pri variable priority training to work and that training that. And found a good deal of success in using variable priority training to improve performance in the task. And one of the more important findings that came out of that is the variable priority training not only improved performance and transferred, but also created more spare capacity, working memory capacity, during the whole task training. Okay? Uh, and it kind of 
relates almost to Yaakov's point about this idea of reserve, and that's what spare capacity is. It's extra capacity that could be used for working memory type tasks. Okay. How am I doing on time? Ten minutes, good. I think that'll work. Here's my quick picture of the advantages of variable priority training versus traditional part task training. In the upper, we train two components of a task separately. We bring them together as their actual performance in the real world. And what we find when we do this, generally speaking, is negative transfer compared to whole task training. It's better to work on train both of them together at the whole time. And the reason why seems, at least in one of my views, is that what is missing when you train the parts separately is you're not learning a time-sharing skill, which is kind of an emergent feature, a glue that holds the two tasks together. It may be a visual scanning skill between the components if it's two visual tasks, some sort of task switching skill. There's a lot of candidates for what this might be. On the other hand, with a variable tr priority training where you emphasize first one task, then the other, the two tasks are always preserved together as an integral whole, and so the glue, the time-sharing skill necessary to bind those two together is always being learned, and you don't have to relearn it when you get into the transfer phase. We've just completed a meta-analysis of different training techniques, particularly looking at part-task training, and of all the part-task training studies, the only type of part task training to show positive transfer is variable priority training. And so it's really, I think, has stood the test of time as being a, a very successful tool in the training environment. And the past talks, I think, have done a nice job of illustrating why that's the case in terms of executive function. Before I leave my little tour of Danny's research career, at least for that first quarter of a century. Um, I want to focus a little bit more on the last, this bottom right leg of the triangle, really focusing on the notion of the tasks vary in their resource demand, in how difficult they are, or we might say what the mental workload imposed by those tasks are. And this is an issue that is very different from the multiplicity issue and really different from the allocation here. But here, Danny and collaborated very much with Sandy Hart of NASA Ames and to some extent with me in terms of helping advance the science of mental workload. Um, and there was a, I, I think, a very fun and delightful collaboration that was had certainly between Danny and Sandy. Um, there's a little story about the tour of Jerusalem with the three of us, and I'm going to postpone that till tonight. If I get a couple of minutes, I'll mention that because there are some very interesting characteristics there in that tour. Uh, but it certainly characterized an important aspect of Danny's, uh, Danny's uh, career. This is the three of us. This was actually at my retirement ceremony back in 2005. Sandy was definitely the, the queen of resources, the queen of mental workload, we might say. I don't know, Danny, if you want to call yourself multiplicity or allocation. I put myself in allocation because I was kind of in the middle and I was allocating between the two of you. But uh, we can discuss that later. This is at the, uh, at university, at the um, Aviation Research Lab at the Institute of Aviation. Okay, a couple of final remarks. Um, one has to do with uh, a, a kind of applauding Danny's role as a generalist. Um, from his mentor, Danny Kahneman, we know he was a generalist. He could take two very disparate areas of academic research in decision making and in attention, bind them together, but also look at each one individually and how they related, how they, uh, uh, but this is getting increasingly rare in these days to have two major domains of research in which one is making a contribution. And of course, for Danny, it's in training applications and attention theory two disparate domains, and yet he's made major contributions in both of them by sort of taking the broad view of science. And so as we conclude, I kind of like to think about uh, what the history of attention research has been, where it's been, and where it's going. Um, 
And going back to our triangle of basic laboratory research, engineering, psychology, and applications, I think we've made tremendous advances in terms of the basic laboratory understanding of attention through, a lot of it is through brain research, and art really gave a good flavor of what a lot of that research is. The event-related potentials, fMRIs, cardiac measures, and a whole host of other advanced methodological techniques that are understanding the role of attention and how it actually plays out in brain activation. On the application side, we're also seeing some major advances, and I think the work by Dave Strayer, um, another University of Illinois uh, PhD and um, actually art study, student, um, looking at cell phones, distracted driving, has probably done as much as almost anything to bring experimental psychology to the fore in the science of safety. Um, but there's a gap, and I see a gap in terms of the advances that engineering psychology has made or not made in terms of what I call the red line of workload. How much workload is too much? And in introducing this last concept, I want to, again, call attention to Danny's research because he started with dichotic listening and attention switching, a very discrete two-state view of attention. You attend here or you attend there. But the middle phase of his career focused much more on this sort of analog, continuous view of attention as effort, something that you could demand more or less of depending on the task or give more or less of depending on your own strategies. But these two get merged in a lot of practical workload situations, which I outline as the following. You're doing two tasks, A and B. The demands of one of those tasks, A, is gradually increased. That's the purple line that goes up. And for a while, you're successful at multitasking. And all of a sudden, bang, you can no longer do them at once. You regress to the sequential stage. You drop one task entirely, OK? The driving task gets, or the con conversation gets increasingly demanding, and all of a sudden the driver stops paying attention to the road and gets totally engrossed in the conversation. So this is a discrete switch from a concurrent task performance to a sequential task performance, a catastrophic abandoning of task B performance. And so this is what sort of defines the red line of workload, that level of task demand at which there are catastrophic breakdowns. How much is too much? And we stop multitasking and start focusing on one and ignoring the other. Well, I am very much aware from my work in human factors how much system developers want this for designing requirements. NASA will come to us and say, tell us how much workload is too much. Give me a value of workload beyond which people cannot perform. And therefore, I will go back to designers as I'm certifying these systems and say, no, you can't. You've got to take it back to the drawing board and make it easier. Well, obviously, to all of us in research, this is not a line. It's a red zone rather than a red line. There's lots of things that make it somewhat fuzzy to define. But I think two of the things that help make it fuzzy is the fact that multiple resources, that resources are multiple. That is, the red line may be farther to the left if all tasks demand on a single resource, farther to the right if tasks can exploit separate resources. But it also depends on the level of training, right? If you're well-trained, you're out here. If you're poorly trained, it's back here. So these are two things. People are demanding a red line. Two things Danny knows a lot about are multiplicity and the level of training that can help modify that. And what I'm saying, Danny, is don't retire. <laughs> this is your next agenda for research. Help us define the red line. I think you're capable of doing that. Okay, thank you.